America and the world mourns as the biggest school shooting in U.S. history took place today at Columbine High School. According to reports, two gunmen came in shooting and began working their way through the school. What police and everyone else are looking for now is a reason for the violence that tore this quiet school and suburban neighborhood apart just weeks before graduation. And the school is in a panic, and I'm in the library. I've got students down under the table, kids. Heads under the table. On April 20th, 1999, the world was shocked as two students at Columbine High School in Littleton, Colorado, carried out the largest and most brutal school shootings in U.S. history to date. Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris, heavily indoctrinated in evolutionary teaching, planned and carried out the massacre on Adolf Hitler's birthday. On the floor, you better stay on the floor! Oh, God! Stay in the line of the Oh, God! The gun is right outside the library door. Harris was wearing a shirt that said natural selection, while Klebold's shirt said wrath. Klebold stated in his journal that he and Harris were godlike and had evolved further than everyone else. The boys would mock and harass everyone they killed. Their victims would be asked if they believed in God. If the answer was yes, they would be killed. If no, they would let them live. Eric Harris had shot Rachel three times and about five or six minutes passed before the final shot. And he walked over to her and lifted up her head by her hair and he said, do you still believe in God? And uh, Rachel looked him in the eye and said, you know I do. Racial slurs were yelled at Isaiah Shoals as he was shot and killed simply because he was an African American. 12 students, one teacher were murdered that day, along with Dylan and Eric taking their own lives. The worldview of evolution was clearly influential behind the thinking of these two young men on that fateful day. Here at Columbine High School, eyewitnesses say that two gunmen came in shooting and began working their way through the school. At first, many students dismissed it as a prank until teachers raced ahead to classrooms, yelling for students to run. And then he came into the cafeteria and you could hear, like, bombs and shotguns going off. And then he came into the library and he was going to kill us if we were of color and if we had a hat. People were getting shot all around me. <laughs> Twelve students and one teacher were killed and more than 25 seriously injured before the two teenage shooters took their own lives. Charles Darwin's book, uh, The Origin of Species, is often what they call simply The Origin of Species. This is not the whole title. They're kind of embarrassed by the whole title today because he was a racist. Of course, in 1859, most people were racist. America still had slavery in 1859. But the whole title to his book is The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. Darwin thought that there were different races of humans, different races of animals, and the strongest survived, and that was good. It was best if the weakest died off. This, of course, motivated Adolf Hitler to speed up the process. Let's figure out who's the weakest and eliminate them, and we can speed up the, the evolution of mankind. 
So, yeah, Darwin uh, certainly was a racist, but I think you could say most people were during that time frame. When you see the term favored races, that tells you a lot about the guy who's writing the book and what his ideology is. He believes that some races are more favorable than others. He thinks that some races are further evolved than others. We have grown as a species because of the tools we make, and each generation, the tools get more advanced. It's how it's been and it's how it always will be. Spontaneous generation must be true not because it had been proven in the laboratory, but because otherwise it would be necessary to believe in a creator. To have somebody say that something must be true, well, why, or else what? The or else is, if that's not true, then there must be a God, there must be a moral law, there must be a final authority, and if there's a final authority, that means that he must have to answer to somebody. So it just seems like a cheap cop-out to say that something must be true or else. It's like, oh, what's the or else? The or else is that you have to answer to somebody, and that somebody is bigger than you. He was the co-founder of evolution. So it shows that Ernst Haeckel and Charles Darwin were some of the most biased scientists on the face of the planet. Ernst Haeckel was a contemporary of Charles Darwin, and Ernst Haeckel uh, loved the idea of evolution and so much that he decided to fake some evidence. He was determined to help Charles Darwin's book become successful by basically, well, not basically, flat out lying about evidence and his bias toward wanting this theory to be true. There are some people who want desperately for evolution to be true, otherwise there must be a God. Ernst Haeckel went over to Germany and he drew these fake drawings of a human embryo and a dog embryo to make them look exactly alike. He was convicted of fraud by his own secular university. In the same textbooks that you studied in school and that any public schooler for the past 130 years has studied are from Ernst Haeckel. So he believed spontaneous generation had to happen, that is, life had to start from non-living material. Otherwise, there would have to be a creator to create it. I, I would agree, there, there was a creator. I happen to know him personally. It wasn't like they just went into the laboratory and just came to the conclusion that there's no God. No, they set out to prove that there is no God. They set out with a presupposition saying, all our scientific claims are gonna be without God. You brought up Charles Darwin, and you hold to Charles Darwin. Um, but I, I, I agree with most of what I've read, yes. Okay. So Charles Darwin's book, The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, I've read you it, ever heard yeah, of it? I've read it. Do you know what the other title of that book is? Mm, no. Okay. The other no. title of the book, and it's the original title of that book, is The Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. That's the title of his book. The strongest survive. Natural selection favors certain race. The human race was the strongest of the hominids. We have, I mean, that's proven. We, we destroyed the Neanderthals when we came in contact with them because Neanderthals came out of Afri Africa 20,000 years before we did. They, they weren't allowed to continue to ev evolve, and we absolutely destroyed them, wiped them off the face of the earth. Evolution is unproved and unprovable. We believe it because the only alternative is special creation. And that is unthinkable. I can imagine the terror that he was feeling inside of him, thinking about God, thinking about having to answer to somebody, you know, this must be the case, a lot of people will say, because they know that there will be repercussions if it's not the case. Now, when you say that something must be true, that means you're going to try to find evidence that proves your case. Now, if it must be true, why does he believe it must be true? What's he hiding? Ernst Haeckel was convicted of fraud by his own secular university. His textbooks are still in our schools today. You know, I understand it takes a while to get textbooks updated, but 130 years, he was convicted of fraud 130 years ago. There is an agenda behind this. A lot of times atheists will make fun of us because they say, you know, we, we, believe, that, we believe in a book that's been written by man. 
here's the thing, all their textbooks have been written by man and they believe all those textbooks and they don't question that for a second. You know, when they see all those embryos that, you know, supposedly all the embryos from all the different animals look exactly like humans, when they see those embryos that were drawn by Ernst Haeckel, you know, they just accept that as fact, but they won't do the research and see that in the early 1900s that was proven false. Ernst Haeckel was shown to be a liar, he was shown to be fraudulent, but somehow those pictures of those falsified embryos are still in textbooks today, but they'll believe it. They're just basing it all off the fact of, of that they don't want to believe in God. If you tell a kid long enough, hey, you're an animal, you're an animal, you're an animal, eventually they're just going to break down and feel like they're worthless and that they're not made in the image of God. Hey, the Bible says that God made us in His own image. And that's why a lot of these school shootings happen. And it's becoming more and more prevalent today as time moves on. Suicide rates have skyrocketed since evolution's been taught in schools. Children being aborted has skyrocketed ever since evolution has been brought into the schools. You know, death and murder has skyrocketed ever since we brought it into the schools and it's infiltrating and it's messing with the minds of the young people and of the next generation. And as a college student, I look at that and I think, wow, if they only knew the evidence, if they only knew the true science that the Bible speaks of, but also the science that is so right and so plain before their eyes. Let me first tell you where I'm coming from. I believe that God created the world. Yeah. I believe that there's only two worldviews. Either one has to believe that somehow um, God created the world, like I would hold to, um, or you'd have to hold to another faith position, which is the world created itself. Your position is that the world created itself, correct? Uh, I think I'm an offshoot of the universe. Uh, we're, we're all offshoots of the Big Bang. The second law of thermodynamics states that ordered things go towards disorder. And in front of me I have a quote from Stephen Hawking. He says, the universe would not exist if there was a decrease in the expansion rate one second after the Big Bang by only one part in 100,000 million million. So that's one chance out of 100,000 million million chances. Is that a great possibility? I don't have enough faith to believe that that came about by itself. Stephen Hawking said, and I quote, he said, if the expansion rate after the Big Bang would have changed by one part in 100,000 million millionths, nothing would exist. So let me ask you this, is one out of 100,000 million millions with a bunch of zeros, a great possibility? No. So you accept by faith that that came about on its own? There could have been a universal mind pulling the strings of evolution. There could have been a universal mind that sprang us up just like that. 90,000 years ago, as the science would indicate. Maybe we came from the stars. There's a theory that we came from the stars and we just gave away all of our technology. We didn't want it no more and we started over and yet here we are again. But that takes faith, that takes irrational faith to believe that. No, that takes it, silly it, faith. It, it takes an imagination to consider it. Just imagine. Yeah. So long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away, basically all of the matter in the entire universe, all of the energy in the entire universe, it was all just crammed into this one little dot, smaller than the period on a page. And even smaller than that, now scientists are saying it was just infinitesimally small. And it was approaching zero in its size, in fact. And then this little dot exploded into the size of our observable universe right now. And it continues to expand even beyond that which we can observe. Let's talk about the Big Bang then, because you say that the, the universe could shoot out here and energy could shoot over there. Since when do you see a Big Bang or an explosion creating anything? Have you ever observed that? Um, I'm not an expert on explosions. Like, like I'm not example, a, a computer. You know, I build computers like this iPhone down here. Like if I said, oh, I believe that iPhone came about by just an explosion, you know, in a, in a Mac store, you would look at me and say, you're an idiot. 
But that's the atheistic worldview, is that, oh, well, it could be anything but God. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. Do you believe that an explosion out of chaos produced order? Out of chaos? Who ever said that an explosion out of chaos? From, from One out of 100,000 million millions chances is chaos. Uh, so you say. I think most people don't really realize that that's what the Big Bang teaches. I, I think if people actually had it explained to them, a lot less people would believe in it because it's, it's just so wild. Evolution is a religion. It is a religion. They have to believe, hope, think that these things happen. Have they ever seen spontaneous generation? Have they ever seen a Big Bang? Have they ever seen one type of animal make another type of animal? They've never seen this. They choose to believe this only because they call it science. Science has to meet three criteria. It has to be demonstrable, it has to be testable, and it has to be provable. You can't demonstrate that a speck of dust exploded 4.6 billion years ago and created all there is. You can't demonstrate that, test it, or prove it. So it's not science, it falls in the realm of religion. You have to accept by faith that one out of 100,000 million million chances happened. And that's just the beginning. So you accept by faith that that happened by chance, correct? The universe shoots us out. Uh, the universe has a mind of its own and it, and it creates life. It creates galaxies. It creates individual systems for life to expand. It, it could be a number of things. If the whole foundation is based on if or a question or uncertainty, what kind of foundation is that? Are you building your faith on questions? You don't just go to a junkyard and say a tornado came through and then built this nice Mustang or this nice Camaro. You don't just say that these type of things are created out of accident. In the same way, a world that is so fine-tuned for our existence can't just magically come into being by a Big Bang. I myself am convinced that the theory of evolution, especially to the extent to which it has been applied, will be one of the greatest jokes in the history books of the future. A lot of times when you talk to evolutionists about this stuff, they don't even know what you're talking about because they're not really even that well versed on these things. They, they really have a lot of faith in their professors and in the science books. So in The Blind Watchmaker, Richard Dawkins said, and I quote, he said, the simplest life has the amount of specified complexity in it of over 1,000 complete sets of encyclopedias. So to me, saying that that came about on its own is like literally saying that this library that we're in came about by an explosion in a printing shop. The human body contains about 100 trillion cells. Just your body, one person, 100 trillion with a T. Each of those little tiny cells is more complicated than a space shuttle. As far as we know, the most complex machine ever built by humans. One cell, more complex than a space shuttle, you've got 100 trillion of them, and they all work together and communicate with each other. You pinch your finger here, your brain knows it up here like that, and your tongue says, ouch. Uh, <laughs> this is amazing the way we're, I mean, beyond amazing how we're designed. And they want to believe this all happened by chance. Let's say, for example, you and I went to a lab and I said, okay, we're going to throw DNA, RNA, and even some membranes in a can of soup. This is what life is made out of, is DNA, RNA, and membranes. Mm -hmm. If I was to put all that together, it would not create life. And in fact, they've never created life. So let me ask you this. So you're saying scientifically we've never created life? Well, even if we did create life, wouldn't that mean there was an intelligence behind it? Well, in, in that situation, yes. Um, well, that situation would have had to taken place at some point in history. But I mean, there, there's... So you're telling me there's intelligence that created life. Oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. The Bible tells us to avoid oppositions of science falsely so called. Now, if he's talking about science falsely so called, there must be such a thing. So what is it? Well, it's pretty obvious in our generation. The huge example of that is the Big Bang and evolution. And my question for people who believe in theistic evolution would be, well then, what's the science falsely so-called? If you basically believe everything that the so-called scientists are telling you, 
then what's the science falsely so called? It's pretty obvious what that is to any reasonable person that that's the Big Bang evolution. The agnostic astronomer Robert Gastro said, and I quote, he said, astronomers now find that they've painted themselves into a corner because they have proven by their own methods that the universe began abruptly in an act of creation to which it can trace the seeds of every star, every planet, every living thing in this cosmos and on the earth. And they have found that this is a product of forces they cannot hope to discover. That there are what I or anyone would call supernatural forces at work is now, I think, a scientifically proven fact. Let me ask you a question. Why is an agnostic astronomer saying that supernatural forces are at work and that it's a scientific fact? I am trying to get the atheist to see that the Big Bang and evolution is faith-based because we all have faith. I choose to put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They choose to put their faith in science falsely so-called. It's crazy, a lot of these scientists that are, you know, science falsely so-called, the religion they promote, they do this all in the name of science. Richard Dawkins claims atheism in the name of science, and the media wants to make it out like it's science versus religion. Their idea of science is a religion. Their whole basis is a religion. Really, they have to change the vocabulary, they have to make a mathematical equation to fit inside of their mathematical equation to basically redefine what a number is in order to make their math work. And so it really then ceases to be math, it ceases to be science, it's just opposing God, and I think we should call them out on it. The one thing I would say to get someone to question evolution is just the fact of the origin of life. You know, how did life begin? Let's talk about the origin of life. Obviously for evolution to be possible and for things to come into being with such precision, it would take a decision. Obviously the sun is burning down, the moon is getting further away, the earth is slowing down in its rotation. Somebody wound things up very precisely and if any one of those quantities were tweaked at all, no life could exist. See, you can say that there's design in everything. I'm not gonna disagree with that. There is, the universe could have designed itself. First law of thermodynamics states that matter cannot be created or destroyed. Stephen Hawking said, and I quote, he said, because there are laws such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. That's stupid. That's retarded. Matter cannot be created or destroyed. So by default, and their worldview violates the very first law of thermodynamics. When you listen to that quote, it's pretty obvious that he's saying that he's going to believe what he wants to believe. And he didn't want to believe in God. And the Bible talks about people who don't even want to retain God in their knowledge. And they worship and serve the creature more than the creator. And that's clearly what these people are. They don't want to retain God in their knowledge. And so they'd rather believe anything except believe in God. So they have to come up with some explanation for how we got here that excludes the God of the Bible. So they come up with the Big Bang, evolution. But what it really comes down to is that they don't love the Lord. And th the scariest thing to them is that the Lord would actually be the creator. So any anything's better than that. If we have to believe in something as crazy as spontaneous generation or their fancy word for it, a biogenesis, they'll do it because anything to reject the God of the Bible, you have them at hello. If you teach that there's no creator, they don't want to retain the creator in their knowledge. So they're willing to strain at a gnat and swallow a camel because they actually end up believing what they want. They're willingly ignorant, the Bible tells us. There's a thousand million different possibilities about how life got on this planet. This planet could have been terraformed by aliens. Uh, I think I'm an offshoot of the universe. Uh, we're, we're all offshoots of the Big Bang. The universe shoots us out. Uh, the universe has a mind of its own and it, and it creates life. It creates galaxies. It creates individual systems for life to expand. It, it could be a number of things. Since when do you see a Big Bang or an explosion creating anything? Have you ever observed that? Um, I'm not an expert on explosions. See, you can say that there's design in everything. I'm not gonna disagree with that. There the is, the universe could have designed itself. Maybe we came from the stars. There's a theory that we came from the stars and we just gave away all of our technology. We didn't want it no more and we started over and yet here we are again. But that takes faith, that takes irrational faith to believe that. No, that takes it, silly it, faith. It, it takes an imagination to consider it. Just imagine. Yeah.
All over the world, petrified trees are found standing up, running through multiple layers. Now, I taught earth science for 15 years, and I've, you know, you're in a room full of earth science and biology books here in my library. They teach that the layers are different ages. That is just not common sense. A tree is not going to stand there for thousands of years waiting for more layers to form around it. The tree is going to rot and fall over in a couple years. <laughs> We've got dead trees on our property. They stand for a couple years and they fall down. But yet here we have all over the world thousands of examples of petrified trees in the vertical position running through many layers of strata. They're called poly, which means many poly strata fossils. Do you actually believe that that tree stood there for millions and millions of years while the sun beat down on it for millions of years while the, while the rock layers collected around it? Do you, do you believe that? How do you suppose that got there, fossilized? Um, I'm not gonna. I'm, I'm not gonna pretend to know. Of course, I've seen uh, I've seen arguments about this before. I know uh, a lot of a lot of people are gonna argue. Well, how did it get into all these different layers? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, what would a worldwide flood do to planet Earth? Uh, it would deposit thousands of feet of sediments containing billions of dead things, which is exactly what we find. Fossils exist all over the world, including the top of Mount Everest. One of the great proofs of the worldwide flood is the fact that we found fossilized seashells up on the very peak of Mount Everest, which means that Mount Everest would have had to have been covered with water. It's a simple fact, but it's a true one. And scientists for many years have been trying to figure out how these fossilized seashells got all the way up to the top of Mount Everest. Now, if you read the Bible, it's very clear that the Bible says that there was once a flood and that the flood covered the entire earth. The entire world was not flooded. Land was okay. showing. But this was found in the top of the Grand Canyon. There's really no excuse for being ignorant of the flood when you have all kinds of evidence for it in the natural world. And of course, you have the ancient witness of the Bible telling you of the flood. Not only that, but other cultures and other religious texts make reference to the flood. The flood legend, as people would call it, or the flood myth is universal to all religions because it actually happened. And so because it actually happened, it's in the collective memory of mankind, which is why every religion, every nationality has some story about the earth being flooded. Obviously we get the true accurate story from the Bible, but the natural world bears witness to it. The collective memory of mankind bears witness to it. And really the only thing that matters to me is that the Bible says it. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. And they're willingly ignorant of the fact that God flooded the earth, that God created the earth, and they take the truth and turn it into a lie. They see that the earth was flooded and that there's sediment, or the Christians see at least, that the earth was flooded and there were sediment layers. But they look at that and say, well, this is a period of time. The Bible's very clear about the order of the flood and how things happened. The Bible teaches a global flood, a flood that covered every hill, every mountain, every animal, every valley. The entire earth was buried under water by the judgment of God. Animals die all the time. Out here in the woods, they're always dying, but none of them get preserved as fossils because they get scattered around by the coyotes or the buzzards or the ants. And so the fact that there are fossils at all is a good indication there was a rapid burial, just like Noah's flood would have done. The Ica civilization, they buried their people sitting up, wrapped up in a blanket, 
and they buried them with stones, uh, various sizes from you know softball size to beach ball size. These stones have carvings on them. Uh, about 500 of the stones have been found to have dinosaurs carved on them. 500 of these stones, at least 500 of them that have been found, have had every known dinosaur on these stones. And how do you think the dinosaurs got eliminated from the world? Uh, I think that it's been proven that an asteroid did it, and that they weren't completely eliminated. The big ones were. The small ones survived. So an asteroid hit this world, hit mm -hmm. this it's Earth. It's happened numerous, numerous times. So an asteroid hit the Earth. Well, why didn't all the other creatures die? All the big stuff died. You, you have to study evolution. So it's true that the evolutionary community does believe that an asteroid hit the Earth and killed off all of the big dinosaurs. What I think is so silly about that is we still have big creatures today that were just as big as the dinosaurs. So the trees were wiped out. Everything, all the big, all the big dinosaurs that were eating high above the, the high stuff couldn't do that no more. So, so, they, so the asteroid was so close that it literally it, almost chopped their head off. That's about as ridiculous as everything else that the Big Bang and evolution teaches. I mean, they just come up with these crazy, wild theories, and it seems like they're almost just trolling us, trying to figure out how weird they can get, and people will still fall for this stuff about dinosaurs being beheaded by asteroids, and it's just, it's, it's just crazy. I mean, these people have a great imagination. And that's why the big dinosaurs died off. A lot of them had to duck for cover. You know, when these asteroids were coming over him. It was one big one. Like Star Wars, man, like sci-fi, you know. It, it was one big one. But like, again, as I've said many, many, many times, prehistory is the best guess scenario. I do hear about, uh, like, um, Aztec pottery or, or these, you know, uh, uh, Indian pottery that has what it looks like to be dinosaurs on it. But, uh, you know, what would I, I would say there is that it's coincidental for it. Like, it, th those aren't actually dinosaurs. Those were just bad drawings that look like dinosaurs to us now. So all of these discoveries of these stones that have been discovered, every single one of these, every different artist was just a bad artist. Compared to what we have now, obviously they were bad artists, but but no, I'm saying that they drew like animals that they saw around them and, it, you know, they, they just, they weren't exactly representing them correctly. Well, there must be a lot of bad artists all over the world then, since there are all kinds of drawings and paintings of dinosaurs all over the world. So I guess bad art's been around for a while. What those stones depict isn't going to back up your creationist story because those stones depict aliens coming down. So you say that aliens would be perfectly depicted on these stones, but not the dinosaurs. They clearly show dinosaurs and humans together. Now, to the evolutionist mindset, this is simply impossible because they've already decided dinosaurs you know, died off 66 and a point two or whatever it is, million years ago, whatever number they're up to now. They used to say 25 million years ago. I know what they depict. I know that there are, this looks like a giant lizard. You're gonna say what, that looks like a Tyrannosaurus Rex? Absolutely. I think the fact that there are humans living with dinosaurs all through history is, uh, is obvious. They're mentioned in the Bible, not the word dinosaur, but I think dinosaurs have always lived with man. They're just giant reptiles, giant lizards. Behold now Bahima, which I made with thee. God knew what the objections would be, and he's already covering it right here. I made behemoth with thee. He eateth grass as an ox. Lo now, his strength is in his loins, and the force is in the navel of his belly. He moveth his tail like a cedar, the sinews of his stones are wrapped together. And Behemoth is clearly a dinosaur. If you just look at the sheer size, the proportions, and when it talks about he moves his tail like a cedar, and then people say, oh, it's an elephant. Have you ever seen an elephant's tail? It's, a cedar doesn't come to mind, okay. Some commentaries and study Bibles will put next to Behemoth, elephant. Okay, elephants don't move their tail like a cedar. Okay, elephants have a very small tail, so that's a ridiculous uh, idea to say that Behemoth is actually an elephant. It says his bones are as strong pieces of brass. 
His bones are like bars of iron. He is the chief of the ways of God. He that made him can make his sword to approach at him. And I believe that that is a foreshadowing of the fact that this animal's going to go extinct. God's basically saying, look, I created Behemoth and I can wipe out Behemoth. And apparently that's what he did since this creature is no longer around. And by the way, the Bible was predicting this thousands of years ago. The Bible thousands of years ago was telling us about these dinosaurs, Behemoth and Leviathan. And then they're discovered in the 1800s and people are like, oh, well, you know, this disproves the Bible. It's like, no, actually this confirms what the Bible was already telling you about these creatures that you hadn't dug up yet, but the Bible talked about them, Behemoth, Leviathan. But Satan is using God's own creatures, i.e. the dinosaurs, to turn people away from God. It's a very effective way to get kids to doubt the Bible. And the kids can't even read yet, and they already think the earth is millions of years old because of dinosaurs. So that's why we try to use them here to, for the exact opposite, to draw people to Christ. Our website, drdino.com, our phone number, 855-BIG-DINO. We want to use dinosaurs to draw people to the Lord. So Tech Times recently came out with an article. It's a secular group. Uh, these guys aren't Christians, but these guys even came out with an article just last month showing that evolution is a fraud. The name of the article is Massive Genetic Study Reveals That 90% of Earth's Animals Appeared at the Same Time. So these guys admit that 90% of animals that we see today all came into being at the same exact time. So true science supports a whole bunch of animals being created at one time. Not this thing of, oh, this species is just millions of years behind this species. It's not a linear progression from this animal to this animal to this animal. It's more just the animals just came on the scene. And they're having to admit that. In analyzing the COL of 100,000 species, Stokel and Thaler, arrived at the conclusion that most animals appeared simultaneously. I'm gonna pull out my trump card now. Mm -hmm. So Tech Times just came out with this article. And this is the title of the article. This is a secular source. It says, Massive genetic study reveals that 90% of Earth's animals appeared at the same time. It says, Landmark new research that involves analyzing millions of DNA barcodes has debunked much of what we know today about the evolution of species. More specifically, they found that 9 out of 10 animal species on the planet came into being at the same time humans did. This conclusion is very surprising, says Dr. Thaler, and I fought against it as hard as I could. So this doctor is saying, look, I fought against it as hard as I could, but I could not deny the evidence. According to this study, you know, it, it actually debunks evolution. So scientists that are evolutionists, you know, they, they're fighting against coming to these conclusions, but the conclusion is, is that there's a creator, and that's why these species all came, came to being at the same time, in the beginning God. This conclusion is very surprising, says Thaler, and I fought against it as hard as I could. Where is this article from? Tech Times, leading science website. Never seen it, um, don't know anything about it, can't comment on it, have no idea. In a massive genetic study, senior research associate at the Program for the Human Environment at Rockefeller University, Mark Stokel, and University of Basel geneticist David Thaler discovered that virtually 90% of all animals on Earth appeared at right around the same time. As to how that could have happened, it's unclear. I believe that it's much more rational that we evolved from apes. This scientist is saying, look, this has debunked tons of the information that we've been given about evolution and yet people are still going to believe it this is a secular source so they have nothing these evolutionists they have nothing the bible says that all creation cries out to god all creation points to christ so the question of which came first the chicken or the egg is a ridiculous question because it would have to be the chicken 
you're not giving that other side of the equation any room to breathe. Well, there is no other side of the equation. That's why they call them the missing links. The absence of fossil evidence for intermediary stages has been a persistent and nagging problem for evolution. Darwin came out with a theory, and in his book he stated that there must be missing links, otherwise that proves his theory to be false. And, you know, science has tried to make up a lot of missing links. They've tried to prove it, but they've been proven false. They've been shown to be fraudulent in the missing links that they try to provide. Um, and so, you know, basically all these missing links that are supposed to exist, they're, they're not there. They don't exist. We have had enough of the Darwinian fallacy. It is time that we cry, the emperor has no clothes. The first part of the scientific method is to make an observation. How, has anybody observed an animal change from kind to kind? Because in order for something to be science, you have to be able to first make an observation. I, I'm fairly certain uh, Darwin's, what is it, the pigeons? You know, no, or the birds. The, yeah, the, the doves, whatever they were. Um, these atheists often, they act like they're so smart, they know so much science. They're really a lot of times just repeating talking points that they've heard from these scientists and professors that they've studied under or just they read one little pop science book about why God's not real or why evolution's true or the Big Bang. These guys haven't really done the real research themselves. And the evidence is that sometimes when you talk to these guys about the science behind the Big Bang or evolution or the evidence for creation, sometimes they don't even know what you're talking about because it's, it's over their head. But today, people don't, people don't want to try to prove evolution. Um, it just, it's just false. They don't do any real science to prove it. And again, one of, those, one of the main um, things that is lacking is the missing links. There are no missing links. The whole chain is missing. I'm going to go with consensus. I'm not going to go with the crazy coot conspiracy theories. I'm just yeah, but this isn't a conspiracy theory. This is a scientifically proven fact that just came out. I, I believe that you, all right, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. Here's what I think that you do. I think that you look for some of the worst arguments you can find to get a reaction. You know, you can lead a horse to water, but you cannot make him drink. And a lot of these evolutionists and a lot of these atheists, they want nothing to do with the facts. Essentially, you can get a universe from nothing without any supernatural shenanigans that basically by quantum mechanics and the laws of physics we understand in principle, an entire universe with a hundred billion galaxies, each containing a hundred billion stars, can come from nothing because its total energy could be zero and therefore you don't need to to literally violate any laws of physics to create a universe. And no, we don't know that for certain. And how did we go from nothing to something? Because, in fact, if you add up all the energy in the universe, it looks like it's zero. This is how uh, education works today in America. It's just everybody's taught, hey, listen, evolution's a fact. The Big Bang's a fact. The Earth being billions of years old is a fact. Just deal with it. And nobody wants to question it because then they're going to be seen as ignorant, uneducated. How can you say it's a fact that the world came from nothing? It defies all the laws of science. No law of science that's ever been tested or proven says that things come from nothing all by themselves. I mean, it's, it's nonsense. It's ridiculousness. And they never ask the real questions. They want to talk about evolution all day long, but that only explains how one life form turned into another. Okay, where'd the first life form come from? How did it come to life? See, instead of showing me a picture of an ape slowly turning into a human, you know that famous picture? I want to see a picture of nothing turning into a single-celled organism. That's what I want to see, because single-celled organisms are extremely complicated. One DNA molecule, just one, is probably more complicated and contains more information than Encyclopedia Britannica. It's just one strand of DNA. If you want to believe that happened by chance, you enjoy yourself, but you're a fool to believe such a thing.
We could put the whole science department of ASU and all these science teachers from all over the school system, we could put them all in a laboratory, we could bring them all of the most high-tech instruments in the world, we could bring them every chemical, every element, every possible substance to work with, and say, create something that's alive! And guess what they couldn't do? They couldn't do it. They could not create anything that's alive. Nothing, not even the simplest thing that's alive, they can create nothing. But we're supposed to believe that it just came to life by itself. And then you also have to believe that it slowly evolved to the point where it became actually a human being as smart as we are. Okay, but if you don't believe it, you're just an idiot, you know, you religious bumpkin. But that's what they think. But professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. You'd have yeah. to be an idiot. You say, well, how dare you call it? The Bible says they're a fool. The very first part of the scientific method is coming up with an observation. It says to make an observation. Well, how are we supposed to observe this evolution which has taken place over billions of years? It's not possible. See, there are six different levels or stages to evolution. First is cosmic evolution. That's the origin of time-space matter. They answer that with the Big Bang, which is extremely stupid. Then there would have to be chemical evolution because the Big Bang would produce hydrogen or helium or lithium or deuterium. But what about gold, silver, platinum? How do you get that out of hydrogen gas? So you have to have chemical evolution. Then they'll say, well, that happens in stars under great pressure. Okay, well, then now you got a problem with stellar evolution. Nobody's ever seen a star form. Never. Nobody's, we see them blow up, never see one form. But there's a lot of stars out there. 70 sextillion is the latest estimate. Then you'd have to have organic evolution. Life has to get started somewhere, somehow, from non-living material. How did life get started? organic evolution. Then you have to have what they call macroevolution. That's where an animal changes into a different kind of animal or plant. Nobody's ever seen that. That's imagination. It's SpongeBob stuff. We can test the fact that, hmm, why are seashells on the top of Mount Everest? Why is there a Grand Canyon that is evidence of, of a global flood? And a lot of times, you know, atheists get sick of us using the same examples over and over again. But yet, why don't you address those examples? You can't prove them wrong. You get mad that we say them over and over again. but you don't really prove them wrong. You just say, well, you know, that we've heard that example before, so why are you saying that again? Why don't you address it? Why don't you address it? And you know this, the Grand Can Canyon argument has been argued on both sides. It's a stalemate. You know it. You're not being untruthful. You're just rejecting a certain side of the truth. Um, it's proof that maybe something terraformed this planet to tune it precisely. I don't think you can prove to an evolutionist anything he doesn't want to believe. They've already decided, don't confuse them, it wouldn't matter, evidence doesn't matter. So we have blood of a Tyrannosaurus Rex that was discovered inside this grave of the dinosaur. Now if it was 65 million years extinct or before us, how did that blood remain the same in an open air environment? Um, again, I don't know. This is not a talking point of yours that I'm familiar with, so I didn't research it. I'm giving you that it's a possibility that your God existed. It's just not a possibility that, that the stories are accurate because they've been disproven. We know that humanists don't believe the Bible, right? So why would we believe what the humanist says about the Bible? The Bible says that God hangs the earth upon nothing, that the earth hangs on nothing, the Bible obviously says in Isaiah chapter 40, is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. So the Bible talks about the earth being a circle. It talks about the fact that it's hanging on nothing. It talks about the fact that when Christ comes, in some place it's going to be day, some place it's going to be night, in that day, in that night. Because, of course, on our spherical earth, parts of the earth are experiencing night while we're experiencing day and vice versa. How did Job know about the equator, the circle of the earth? Well, he knew that because God was telling him what to write. It wasn't man's writing, it's God's writing. So when people say, oh, you know, the Genesis account's inaccurate, the earth couldn't possibly be around 6,000 years old, that's crazy. Um, you know, it's been scientifically proven again and again that the earth is young. And you know, just because somebody makes a claim with a straight look on their face doesn't mean that that's gonna be the truth. 
Scientists who go about teaching that evolution is a fact of life are great con men, and the story they are telling may be the greatest hoax ever. In explaining evolution, we do not have one iota of fact. You're not giving that other side of the equation any room to breathe. Well, there is no other side of the equation. That's why they call them the missing links. Um, it's proof that maybe something terraformed this planet to tune it precisely. Well, then how did it get created? Well, um, by a very slow process. Well, how did it start? Nobody knows how, how, how it started. We know the kind of event that it must have been. We know the sort of event that, that must have happened for the origin of life. And what was that? It was the origin of the first self-replicating molecule. Right, how did that happen? I told you, we don't know. So you have no idea how it started? No, 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 no nor has anybody. Nor has anyone else. else. And I suppose it's possible that you might find evidence for that if you look at the, um, at the detail details of biochemistry, molecular biology, you might find a signature of some sort of designer. Wait a second. Richard Dawkins thought intelligent design might be a legitimate pursuit? Um, and that designer could well be a higher intelligence from elsewhere in the universe. After talking to many atheists about their worldview, I began to wonder where their ideas came from. There is no way that ideas such as aliens creating us, or the world creating itself from nothing, could be drawn through rational thought. I came to the conclusion that they had to have gotten these ideas from someone else. I decided to look at what the modern proponents of atheism were teaching about the origin of life. To my surprise, Lawrence Krauss, Richard Dawkins, and many other leaders of atheism have stated that the world literally created itself from nothing. Of course, this goes in violation of the very first law of thermodynamics. If these scientists can't even come up with a worldview that's compatible with the very first law of thermodynamics, why would we listen to anything else they say? Professor Hawking claims that the Big Bang theory of creation can now be explained by science alone, without the need to consider some form of divine intervention. Because there are laws, such as gravity, the universe can, and will, create itself from nothing. All of the curriculum and the whole system is being run and mandated by people who are anti-God. They're not just neutral about God, they're actually anti-God. They actually have an agenda to teach atheism. They literally teach in the science class that the whole world created itself from nothing, which is stupidity and foolishness. But this is the kind of folly that comes out of the mouth of a fool. Only a stupid person would say, oh, the whole world just created itself from nothing. And if you don't believe it, you're uneducated. I mean, how ridiculous is it to think, oh, see everything? that you see here, the whole universe, guess what? It all just created itself out of nothing. There's no God. Well, where did this stuff come from? Oh, it exploded. What exploded? Um, I don't know, nothing. I was reading a news article and Richard Dawkins came out and said, I cannot condemn mild pedophilia. Richard Dawkins uh, has made some statements that some are considering to be a little bit odd. He essentially defended mild pedophilia a man who in one breath says if you meet a Christian, mock him openly in public, and yet in the next breath he'll say, oh, well, you know, I really can't condemn my old pedophilia. I don't see anything wrong with it because it was a different time. You know, the Bible stands true over time. Sure, we believe that the earth is 6,000 years old. Your mainstream speaker believes that it's okay to inappropriately touch children and openly accepts that it's okay. But yet we're the crazy ones. We're the crazy ones for thinking that the reason there are seashells at the top of Mount Everest is because of the flood and Noah. As I continued my research, I found that the leaders of atheism are teaching principles that are based on science fiction instead of factual and testable data. It's hard to argue against the possibility that all of us are not just the creation of some kid in a parent's basement, 
programming up a world for their own entertainment. And then every time something weird happens in the world, some disruptive leader takes charge. And I wonder if that programmer's just got bored. As I studied Neil deGrasse Tyson, I found that his views on reality are based solely on science fiction instead of observable reality. His views are the equivalent to that of movies like The Matrix in Star Wars. Now you're a character in that world and you think you have free will and say, I want to invent a computer, so you do. Hey, I want to create a world in my computer. And then that world creates a world in its computer. And then you have simulations all the way down. I mean, it's ridiculous. But literally, because people have such a desire to just kind of fit in and not question things, they will literally go along with it to the point of, ha, 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 you mean you don't believe in the Big Bang? <laughs> it's like the emperor's new clothes. You remember the fable of the emperor's new clothes? Remember the emperor is naked, okay? And they tell everybody, oh, he has these new clothes and they're so beautiful and everybody talks about how great they are. And you know, you can only see them if you're wise though. And of course, the guy's nude, but everybody pretends that they see it, even though nobody sees it, because it isn't there. If I was to come out and say I have faith in the Bible, I'm mocked, and Richard Dawkins has said mock Christians openly in public. And yet somebody wants to believe that out of nowhere, nothing created something, and over billions of years, here we are. Neil deGrasse Tyson recently came out, and he stated that he believes we're in a computer machine. He says he believes that we're part of somebody's video game system. So it could be a video game system, but not God. You know, Richard Dawkins came out and said, he says, oh yeah, I believe it's possible that we could have had aliens put us here. So he's saying that aliens could have created us, but not God. Stephen Hawking, that there was an article that was written about him and they say, Hawking has stated that given the vastness of the universe, aliens likely exist. Notice what the writers also say about him. They say he was also becoming more intuitive and speculative rather than relying on mathematical proofs. So Hawking point blank admits that he was becoming more intuitive and speculative rather than relying on mathematical proofs. I, Steve I Hawking know. said that he was becoming more intuitive and speculative about his science rather than relying on mathematical proofs. In order for something to be science, it has to be demonstrable, testable, and provable. So if I came up to you and said, Nakasuchi, I want to be more intuitive about my science. I want to be more speculative. Is that science? No. No, I, I would say no. After doing my research, I've come to the conclusion that most atheists don't even know that their worldview goes directly against the very first law of thermodynamics. In this film, we have only touched the tip of the iceberg regarding the evidence for the biblical account of creation. The theory of evolution has been disproven time and time again by true science. Before this theory even came out, God's word warned us that these lies would come about. The Bible clearly tells us to avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. Being Johnny's father was uh, a huge blessing. Um, Johnny was uh, a blessing. He was never really a burden, although we had our problems, we had our trials with him. But being his dad was, uh, was, a, was a huge blessing. Um, Johnny taught me more than I could ever have taught him in his entire lifetime. He taught me patience. He taught me um, how to how to love people unconditionally, because that's how he loved us. And uh, he taught us great faith. Uh, Johnny had a great relationship with God. And um, he was a, a young man that really believed in the power of prayer. He prayed a lot. And uh, he was just a, he was a blessing. He was my buddy. And um, 
I thank God for the opportunity and the privilege to be his dad. We always had an extra measure of God's grace. Um, I, um, I'll never forget when Johnny was born, um, I was in the operating room and they showed us Johnny and whisked him off to intensive care and um, escorted me out of the, the operating room, the delivery room, and brought me into the locker room and told me to change out of my scrubs, get in my street clothes, and the doctor would meet me uh, in, the, in the waiting room um, uh, when he was done working with uh, Joanne, my wife. And I remember leaning against the lockers, tears just streaming down my face and saying, God, I can't do this. I can't do this. I need your grace and I need your strength. And I have a wife that needs a husband that's gonna walk with God and show her that God's real. And two other boys that were gonna need their dad to be able to show them that God can get us through whatever comes our way. And I can tell you with great confidence and great joy that God heard that locker room prayer that day. And uh, for over 30 years, the Lord's blessed us with an extra measure of His grace. And that's really where our peace and our strength came from. Um, time after time in intensive care waiting rooms, in operating waiting rooms, in um, you know, emergency rooms, uh, I would look over at my wife and, uh, you know, we're both asking the same questions inside, why we have to go through this again. And I told her, honey, it's just another opportunity to experience the grace of God. And I didn't mean that in a flippant way because it was the truth. We have been given an extra measure of grace by our God. And that's where that strength and that peace comes from. That's how we endured the, the, the surgery after surgery, and then even Johnny's home going. God's grace um, strengthened us. And when Johnny passed away, my wife was in Atlanta, Georgia, visiting our other children. Our other son just had a baby. And when Johnny passed away, I was here alone. He was in his bedroom. He had gotten up, got dressed, made his bed, and was heading out to start his day and um, his heart gave out and he collapsed on the floor. And when I found him on the floor, it was the worst moment of my entire life. There was grief in my heart that I, 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 I have never felt in my life. There were sounds coming out of me that I've never heard before. And as I held his body close to my heart and I wept, in that very moment, there was some joy because Johnny had wanted to go home to be with the Lord. He had prayed for the last year and a half that God would take him home because he was in so much pain. And at that brief moment, grief and joy came together. And they came together because Johnny's prayers were answered. And he was home with the Lord, he was whole, he was, his body was whole. And in my heart I thought, run Johnny, run. Run, enjoy heaven, and your faith became sight. And I just remember just at that moment, and it didn't last long, but for that brief time, there was some joy in my heart for him. And that can only happen by the grace of God and by knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior and having the hope of heaven. And um, that's, that's, that's what it was like being Johnny's dad and get strength that God gave us through that time.
I am confused. Being philosophically consistent and being a very honest person, I'm sure you can tell me where God came from. And it, in, addition, in addition, once you've told me where God comes from, uh, please try to clarify how you can figure that a spiritual force can have an impact on a material universe to create it. I think that some years ago we already talked about that kind of thing in uh, philosophical circles at any rate by posing the question, if angels are made of uh, spiritual matter and a pen is made of material matter and spiritual matter displaces no space, how many angels can dance on the tip of a pen? <laughs> I have a sense of sort of uh, uh, reversal experience here, but but please do go ahead. You got five minutes. Now I just want to know which question. That's all right. You, you may take the first two minutes. We're supposed to do one question at a time. Which one would you like? That was part of the format for the debate. So which which? Question? I want you to fill in the story of the rest of the uh, beginning of the universe. God, spiritual matter, impact on material matter. Okay. So two questions. All right. Go ahead. All right, your question, where did God come from, assumes that you're thinking of the wrong, uh, obviously it displays that you're thinking of the wrong God, <laughs> because the God of the Bible d is not affected by time, space, or matter. If he's, if he's affected by time, space, or matter, he's not God. Time, space, and matter is what we call a continuum. All of them have to come into existence at the same instant, because if there were matter but no space, where would you put it? If there were matter and space but no time, when would you put it? You cannot have time, space, or matter independently. They have to come into existence simultaneously. The Bible answers that in ten words. In the beginning, there's time. God created the heaven, there's space, and the earth. There's matter. So you have time, space, matter created, a trinity of trinities there. Just, you know, time is past, present, future. Space has length, width, height. Matter has solid, liquid, gas. You have a trinity of trinities created instantaneously. And the God who created them has to be outside of them. If he's limited by time, he's not God. The guy who created this computer is not in the computer. He's not running around in there changing the numbers on the screen, okay? The God who created this universe is outside of the universe. He's above it, beyond it, in it, through it. He's, he's unaffected by it. So for, and the, the concept that a, a spiritual uh, force cannot have any effect on a material body, well then I guess you'd have to explain to me things like emotions and love and hatred and envy and jealousy and, and rationality. I mean, if your brain is just a random collection of chemicals that form by chance over billions of years, how on earth can you trust your own reasoning processes and the thoughts that you, you think? Okay? So, um, I, your, your question, where did God come from, is assuming a limited God. And that's your problem. The God that I worship is not limited by time, space, or matter. If I could fit the infinite God in my three-pound brain, he would not be worth worshiping, that's for certain. So that's the God that I worship. Thank you. Hi, this is Pastor Roger Jimenez from Verity Baptist Church in Sacramento, California. I'd like to take a few minutes and speak to you about how you can know for sure that you are on your way to heaven. 1 John 5.13 says this, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. This verse explains to us that we may know that we have eternal life. And I'd like to talk to you about how you can know for sure that you are on your way to heaven. First, you must admit that you are a sinner. Romans 3.10 says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. 
The word righteous is referring to someone who's without wrong. You and I might say someone who's perfect. And here the Bible says there is none righteous. Or we could say there is none perfect, no, not one. Romans 3.23 says this, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible defines the word sin as the transgression of the law. When we break God's law, we've sinned. So for example, God says I shouldn't lie. If I tell a lie, that's a sin. God says I shouldn't steal. If I steal something, that's a sin. And this verse says, for all have sinned. That word all includes everyone. That means that I'm a sinner. That means that you're a sinner. Secondly, we must realize the penalty of our sin. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Bible says that there are wages for our sin. The word wages means payment. It's something you earn. When I go to work, what I earn is money. But when I sin, what I earn is death. Now this verse is not simply referring to a physical death because in Revelation chapter 20 verses 14 and 15 the Bible says this, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You may be wondering, what is the second death? Well, notice what it says. They were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. See, when someone dies physically, that's just the first death or the initial death. But when that individual then gets thrown into hell, the Bible calls that the second death. And in Romans 6.23, when it said, for the wages of sin is death, it's not just referring to a physical death, but it's also referring to the second death. See, we need to understand that our sin has condemned us to hell. Revelation 21, 8 actually gives us a list of who's going to hell. The Bible says this, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters. Now that's a pretty bad list. Most people would say a murder is a pretty bad sin. But at the end of that list, he says this, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And here's what you need to understand. We've all lied. The Bible says, let God be true, but every man a liar. And the point that God's trying to make when he adds that sin at the end of the list that we've all committed is that there is none righteous, is that we are all sinners and our sin has condemned us to hell. And you may be able to say, and I may be able to say, well, I've never killed anyone, but I've at least told a lie before. And that's enough to send us to hell. James 2.10 kind of puts it all together. It says, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Thirdly, you must accept that salvation is a free gift. Romans 6.23 said, For the wages of sin is death. We understand what that means now, right? The payment of sin is death, not just a physical death, but the second death, being cast into the lake of fire. The second part of that verse says this, But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the Bible says that God has a gift He wants to give us, and that gift is eternal life, and it's through Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Verse 9 goes on to say, Not of works, lest any man should boast. Now let me use an illustration to explain this concept. Let's say today was your birthday and I was going to give you a gift. Let's say I was going to give you this Bible. And I said, Here you go, happy birthday. What would you have to do for this Bible to become yours? Well, all you'd have to do is accept it. Now, if I said, well, you know, this Bible cost me $10. I'm going to give you this free birthday gift, but you need to give me $10. Is that a gift? The answer is no. Because as soon as you give me money for it, now you're paying for it. It's no different than you going to the store and buying it yourself. What if I said, all right, I'm going to give you this free birthday gift. You don't have to give me any money for it. All you have to do is wash my car. Is that a gift? The answer is no. Because as soon as you're washing my car, now you're working for it. Now you're earning it. See, a gift by definition is free. You can't pay for it and you can't earn it. That's why the Bible says, not of works, lest any man should boast. Salvation is not something we earn by the way that we live our lives or by being religious. Some people think, yes, but you have to repent of your sins to be saved. They think that you have to turn away from your sins in order to go to heaven. But here's what you need to understand. In Jonah chapter 3 and verse 10, the first part of the verse says this, And God saw their works, 
that they turned from their evil way. Here we see an example of people who turned from their evil way, and God referred to that as works. So see, if you believe that you have to repent of your sins or turn away from your sins to be saved, you are actually adding works to salvation, and salvation is a free gift that is not of works. In Matthew 21 and verse 32, Jesus said this, For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him, and ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterwards that ye might believe him. See, the Bible teaches that repentance is a change of mind. And here we see Jesus saying, you did not believe, and if you would have repented, you would have believed. See, repentance in regards to salvation is simply going from unbelief to belief, or from believing in the wrong thing, trusting in your works or in your religion to save you, and, from tr and turning from that to trusting on the Lord Jesus Christ alone. Fourthly, you must believe that Jesus Christ paid for your sins. Romans 5.8 says this, But God commendeth His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You need to understand about the Lord Jesus Christ that He was not just a man. He was not just a prophet. He was not just a good teacher. Matthew 1.23 says this, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. One of the names of Jesus was Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, why would you name a child God with us? Well, because he was God with us. He was not just a man, he was God in the flesh. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1.14 says, And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 1 Timothy 3.16, the first part of the verse says this, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. See, the Bible tells us that God was manifest in the flesh. It tells us the Word was made flesh. It tells us the Word was God. These are all references to Jesus and the fact that He was God in the flesh. Because He was God, He was also without sin. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For He hath made Him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. The Bible says about Jesus that He knew no sin. And what you need to understand is that the gospel is this, that Jesus came to this earth. He was born of a virgin. He was God in the flesh. He lived a sinless life. He never sinned. And He died on the cross, not to pay for His own sins, because He had no sins. He died to pay for our sins. The Bible says that He was buried, and He rose from the grave three days later as a payment for our sin. The Bible tells us that for those three days and three nights, his body was buried, but his soul went down to hell. Acts 2.31 says this, He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. John 3.16, the most famous verse in the Bible says, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. See, the gospel is that Jesus, through his death, burial, and resurrection, paid for our sins. And not that we pay for our sins by living a good life or being religious. There's a fifth thing you need to understand about salvation, and that is that salvation cannot be lost. If you look at the last part of John 3.16, it says, but have everlasting life. John 3.15, the verse right before says, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. All throughout the Bible, we're told that God wants to give us everlasting life, which is life that will last forever, or eternal life, life that will never end. Now, let's say God said, I'm going to give you everlasting life starting right now, eternal life starting today, life that will last forever. It's never going to end. When would that life end? Would it end five years from now? No. Would it end a thousand years from now? No. It's never going to end. Now, what if God said, I'm going to give you everlasting life, and let's say, hypothetically, that five years from now, you walk in a bank, and you rob the bank, and you kill somebody. Do you think God would take away your everlasting life? Well, He can't take it away, because if He takes it away five years from now, then it didn't last forever. And that would make God a liar. Titus 1-2 says this, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie, promise before the world began. See, the Bible says that our hope for eternal life 
is that God cannot lie. When God makes a promise, he keeps it. And if he says, I'm going to give you everlasting life, then it will be everlasting. Now, don't misunderstand what we're saying. We're not saying that because you're saved, you can run around robbing banks and killing people. Of course, we understand that on this earth, there are consequences for our sin. We understand that on this earth, we reap what we sow. And on this earth, God does chastise us and disciplines us for our sins. But what you need to understand that once God saves you, once he gives you everlasting life, he'll never take it away. The beautiful thing about salvation is that when God forgives you of your sins, he forgives you of all your sins, your past sins, your present sins, and your future sins. Lastly, you must call upon Jesus Christ to save you. If I said I was going to give you a gift, and I went out and I bought this Bible, I wrap it up, I put a bow on it, I put a tag on here and I write your name, and I said, here you go, happy birthday. And let's say you said to me, thanks, but no thanks, and you rejected my gift. Did this Bible ever become yours? No. Why not? Because you did not accept it. Now, was it paid for? It's paid for because I bought it. Was it meant for you? It has your name on it but it never became yours because you did not accept it. The gift of God is the exact same way. Jesus Christ already paid for it on the cross, and he offers it to all of us freely, but we get a choice whether we'd like to accept it or reject it. Now, if you could accept the gift of God, would you do it? Well, the Bible tells us how you can do that. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, it says this, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. The word confess means to admit. What are you admitting? Well, you're admitting that you're a sinner and you're admitting that you deserve to die and go to hell, but you're calling upon Christ to save you. Romans 10, 13 says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you need to understand that it's not just saying words that saves you. Romans 10, 9 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, but it goes on to say this, and shalt believe, that's the faith, in thine heart. What are you believing? That God hath raised him from the dead. You're believing that Jesus Christ died on the cross, was buried, and rose from the grave as a payment for my sin. Not that I pay for my sins by living a good life or doing good things or turning from my sin, but that his sacrifice was enough to purchase my salvation. The Bible says this, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, it says thou shalt be saved. It doesn't say you might be saved. It doesn't say you hopefully will be saved. God says, I will save you if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. I don't know if you noticed, but everything I showed you came straight out of the Bible. If you believe what I've showed you from the Word of God today, if you're willing to admit that you're a sinner, if you realize that your sin has condemned you to hell, if you accept the fact that salvation is a free gift, which means you don't earn it, you don't work for it, if you believe that Jesus Christ, who is God in the flesh, died, was buried, and resurrected as a payment for your sin, if you understand that salvation cannot be lost because it is the gift of eternal life and it will last forever no matter what you do, if you believe all of that, then I would like to help you form a prayer. Now, I want you to understand this is not a magical prayer. The prayer in and of itself does not save you, but God tells us that when you confess with your mouth and if you believe in your heart, He will save you. So if you believe all that, just repeat after me. Jesus. I know that I'm a sinner and I deserve to go to hell. Please forgive me of all my sin and please give me eternal life. I'm not trusting in myself. I'm only trusting in you. Amen. If you believed in your heart and you called upon Christ to save you, I'd like to congratulate you because according to the Bible, you are saved and you never have to worry about where you will spend eternity. Thank you very much for listening to this video. God bless.